Hello, thank you. I'm, I'm truly thrilled at how much coverage there has been at this meeting about this really insidious problem in our IBD patients. Um, and so I think diagnosis and really making the appropriate diagnosis is critical. Um, and so that's really what we're gonna be focusing on for the next 15 minutes. Here are some of my relevant disclosures. And so since I'm kicking things off, you know, we really have to go back to the basics. C. diff is an anaerobic, gram-positive, spore-forming, toxin-producing bacillus. It is spread via the fecal-oral route, uh, and it is really has two forms, the spore form, which we're going to get a little bit more into uh, later, and the vegetative or toxin-producing form, and it's really the toxin that makes you ill. And that's why we really harp on hand-washing with this infection, because you're mechanically removing those spores from your hands. The scope of the problem, it is the most common cause of healthcare associated infection in the US. This encompasses, you know, not outside of just IBD. And really we estimate a half a million new cases annually in the US alone, and, and really significant uh, high death rates associated with that. Uh, the scope of the problem in IBD, the prevalence of C. diff in IBD patients is anywhere between three and eight-fold higher than non-IBD patients, depending on which study you read. And these patients have an overall 10% lifetime risk of getting the infection. And then once they have the infection, these patients yield a 4.5-fold higher risk of recurrence. And we know that it's our patients with colitis that really are at highest risk. And so this is an older study, but I think really helps to illustrate that while there is this exponential rise in C. diff, we are still seeing an exponential rise among our, our IBD patients as well. And when you break it down by disease phenotype, it's really our ulcerative colitis patients that are driving this, although our Crohn's patients, and specifically our Crohn's colitis patients, are certainly not immune. And the sequelae of C. diff and IBD are several. We know that C. diff leads to exacerbations of IBD. This can really be a disease-defining event for many patients. It leads to increase in hospitalizations, length of stay, escalation of their IBD therapy, the need for colectomy with overall higher mortality rates. We know that patients with IBD often have a failure of CDI medical therapy, more so than non-IBD patients. They often have more recurrences, as we just mentioned, and overall a significant healthcare costs. And so how are we actually making this diagnosis? I will just remind everyone, these are just some general risk factors for initial in, uh, infection in the general population, of which IBD is one. Um, but certainly recent treatment with antibiotics, exposure to healthcare or long-term care facilities, immunosuppression, and again, IBD, in the, even in the absence of immunosuppression, uh, is a risk factor, elderly age and PPI exposure. In our IBD patients, what's important to note is C. diff often presents with atypical features, so it won't look exactly like your non-IBD patients. It often can develop even in the absence of antibiotic use. These patients are often younger. It can be community onset. These patients don't typically develop the classic pseudomembranes that you will see in your non-IBD patients, and many of these patients will be colonized um, without actual infection, and so really trying to distinguish between that can be really challenging. And so when you're thinking about diagnosis, generally speaking, for C. diff, this I just pulled from the Brigham you know, Infectious Disease website um, in our system. And so really we're talking about the presence of diarrhea as well as a positive test. So generally speaking, when you're diagnosing C. diff, you need those two things. Obviously, that can pose some challenges in our IBD patients where there is significant symptom overlap. Both of these diseases have diarrhea as the most predominant symptom, often will have fever and abdominal pain. And so, again, clinical differentiation can be quite challenging. And so this is why we always harp on the fact that if any patients with IBD are presenting with worsening symptoms, C. diff should be tested out the gate. That should be the first thing you think about. And so now I think what is the most, probably one of the most challenging and nuanced areas within this space is testing. And so I just think it's really important to know what testing you're ordering, to know what your personal lab is doing, um, and really have the conversation with your micro lab. If you're an IBD doctor who's ordering C. diff tests often, this is really going to be important for your practice. So what I'm going to do is just walk you through the three most common tests you'll probably encounter, irregardless of where you're practicing, and, and really talk through sort of what they each mean. So this is a triple test panel um, from my hospital, and I'm going to go through what each of the three tests are. 
So the first test you will encounter or may encounter is the antigen test. This is also called GDH, depending on what your lab uh, wants to call it. Uh, this is the glutamate dehydrogenase test. It is an, uh, an ELISA-based test that is specifically looking for the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme produced by all C. diff isolates, both toxic and non-toxigenic strains. So it's essentially a first-pass screen. It is giving you information about the presence of bacteria to warrant further testing. The next test is the toxin test, also called the EIA toxin test, or EIA, depending on what you're reading. And this is a test, and again, an ELISA-based test that is specifically looking for the presence of toxin. And so this, in older iterations of this test, was really felt to be not very sensitive. Uh, and so there was a, a lot of concern for high false negative rates. And we've been talking a lot about this at this meeting. Depending on how long you've been practicing, you may remember needing to do three or four consecutive tests in order to get diagnostic accuracy for C. diff. We're obviously not doing that anymore. And it's felt that the diagnostic um, accuracy of this test is better, although it's still not perfect. And so there is always, you know, in the back of your mind, should be thinking of, is this is potentially a false negative depending on your patient and the situation. Um, I can tell you though, I think there is generally more confidence in this test than there certainly used to be. But because of this uncertainty, there was a big swing towards PCR testing, and I'm sure many of your institutions do PCR-only testing. Um, we used to use PCR as a confirmatory test, as you can see in this report. And so what is PCR? I think this can be very confusing for many people. The test may say PCR, it may say DNA, it may say toxin DNA, you may also see it NAAT. All of these are referring to the same test. And what this is, is it is not looking for the presence of toxin, but it is looking for genetic material that codes for toxin. So it is telling you about the presence of toxigenic organisms. And so if you only have a PCR test in front of you, you can't really tell the difference between colonization and actual infection. So you have to put both the clinical information as well as the test result together to make a decision. And so I can tell you at my institution, We've gotten rid of PCR testing, and we're only doing GDH reflex to EIA, although you may see different permeations, again, of this, depending where you are. This is now um, supported by guidelines, you know, the Eschmidt guidelines, which came out now a few years ago, really recommended that a single test probably isn't good enough. You really should be, at a minimum, doing two-step testing, although I'm sure some of your institutions are still doing triple testing, like we used to do. And really what you want to do is make sure you're starting with a very sensitive test, and that can be either GDH or PCR as your first pass screen to really identify the presence of organisms and reflex to toxin um, to really identify confirmed infections. Some testing caveats. If the patient was already started on antibiotics, maybe you're, you're, you were very worried about this patient, so you just told them to get on the Vanco, or they were in an ER and they just got right put on therapy, you should be concerned that if you were to test after the fact that the test will likely be falsely negative. I don't think you can really trust any testing that was done once antibiotics have been started. And so if your clinical suspicion was high enough, you really just have to treat through, essentially. Well, we don't recommend repeat testing, so if your testing is negative today, you don't have to re you know, test again tomorrow and the next day. I mean, in fact, your micro lab likely won't let you do that. Um, and we don't recommend testing for cure. You really go based on clinical symptoms. If the patient is improving with antibiotic therapy, we certainly don't recommend that you test at the end to confirm that the testing is negative. It likely won't be. And so I do just want to spend a minute talking about recurrent infections. Recurrent C. diff is really the recurrence of symptoms after a successful initial course of therapy, meaning you gave the patient treatment, their diarrhea improved, they're feeling better, and days to weeks later, their symptoms come back without any other, say, inciting antibiotic courses, for example. And we know that this can be from the endogenous strain that led to their initial infection or acquisition of a new strain. We don't routinely do strain level analysis because it doesn't change our management. Although when this has been looked at, the vast majority of patients were essentially being uh, reinfected with the same strain that they had their initial infection from. We generally think of the window of recurrence as eight weeks. So that's when I tell patients, we're going to be watching you really closely for eight weeks. If we make it to eight weeks and nothing has happened, we generally think you're in the clear. Um, and this can really occur. I've seen it occur very quickly within days. But again, eight weeks is sort of the, the window where you really want to be watching patients closely. <clears throat> 
When I'm receiving somebody in my clinic for a, uh, a consult for recurrency diff, this is generally what I'm expecting to see. You know, you really have a test and then a month later another test and then a month later or you know two months later another test what is not recurrency diff is a positive test from 2016 and then another positive test this month that is not recurrency diff those were two isolated new infections and so i don't treat that as recurrency diff risk factors for recurrency diff advancing age any prior recurrence of course recurrent antibiotic exposure or patients on long-term antibiotic therapy more virulent strains as your initial um, infection. You know, we all know of NAP1, but there are several. Um, and certainly IBD with colitis, as we talked about, is a risk factor for recurrence. Um, and we also know that low serum antitoxin A, I, G, M, um, your host immune response really does put you at risk for increased recurrence. We know that an altered intestinal microbiome certainly um, is at play here. As you can see in blue, or actually I should say, if you've never looked at a microbiome plot, where you want to be, and I'm not very close to a screen, but you want to be up here. You want to be in this corner. That's a lot of diversity. You want a lot of richness to your microbiome. And what you can see is by the time you have your first infection, you already have decreased in the richness of the amount of phyla present. And by the time you have recurrent uh, C. diff, you're all the way down here. You no longer have the tools to be able to overcome this infection. And why is that? We know it's not just which bugs are present, not the microbial membership, if you will, but really the function of your microbiome. And specifically, I'm just going to spend a minute talking about bile salt metabolism. And so again, when we think about those spores, C. diff is communicated by spores. You swallow them. They're in your gut. And only under the right circumstances will they germinate, release toxin, and make you ill. And germination is really critical. Without that, you don't have C. diff infection. And we know that bile acids are critical to germination. And so in experiments, we've seen, you know, if you put spores in a Petri dish with primary bile acids, they germinate and release toxin. And that's not the case with secondary bile acids, which seem to be protective. And so in health, you have a gut that is enriched with secondary bile acids. And so what we think happens is you take your clindamycin for your tooth abscess, you ablate those members of your microbiome that have those really critical enzymes, and you're overrun with a gut rich in primary bile acids that puts you at risk for C. diff and further recurrence. And so I'll just mention, this is, my lab is very interested in this. We've looked at using bile acids as predictors of recurrence, both in IBD and non-IBD patients. And we're starting to see that this may be, uh, we may, we're hoping that we may be able to use this really as a predictor upfront to identify patients who are at risk for getting uh, worse disease down the line so we may uh, treat them more appropriately upfront. So I will just conclude by stating that IBD patients are at increased risk for C. diff, which certainly can result in many significant disease sequelae for these patients. Again, presentation may be atypical. It always needs to be on your mind. And if worsening symptoms, always test. And as of right now, a two-step testing method is advised, um, but certainly take in mind the testing characteristics of whichever test you're using. Thank you so much.